to get by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Well, yeah, able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani around the front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Three the fans score one. Score! So I made the mistake of telling my girlfriend that I'm not the world's biggest Linkin Park fan, and I made the mistake of telling her this at dinner. Um, so then we get back in the car. She reaches for the aux cable, plugs in, starts playing Linkin Park. We get home. I take my dog out for a walk. She jumps in the shower. She's playing Linkin Park the entire time, and she's playing it incredibly loud just to make sure that I hear it. What I'm saying is, is that I am an idiot. Oh, is this a true story? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought this was one of those like tangents that you went on in the beginning. No, no, no. This is genuinely oh, true. Geez. This is tonight. This happened tonight. So she's, she's the playing... biggest Linkin Park fan. No, she doesn't give a shit. She just likes to play them to bother me. Because you don't like them. I think they're fine. Yeah, they're fine. They have three songs. I'm in that same boat. They're fine. There are some people three who worship them. Though. I'm sure we're pissing off a few of our listeners who are big Linkin Park fans, but suck it up. I mean, they're okay. They're fine. No, were I, they not like uh, now? They're not the same genre, but for a while there, did they not turn into what kind of like Imagine Dragons is now, where they they were just like movie songs? No, I think that's actually pretty much dead on. Like movie, I think yeah, Linkin movie Park songs was and Imagine soundtracks. Dragons. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, pretty much. And then like doing songs with like. Pop stars Michael. and rappers and like mm. yeah, yeah 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 okay that tracks. There's always one of those around. That's a good point. I didn't think of them as that as like they're in that line of like quote unquote alternative rock bands that are like in all the movies and shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, hey, you, they made money off of it. They found a way to make. Hey, money. no, shout out to them. So credit to them. You know who surprisingly was in that group of like rock bands that are just everywhere, but only as like m- like as music. Yeah. Three doors down. Mm-hmm randomly their music was all over the place yeah i think like, another one who like subtly were like that but i don't think they intentionally meant to be like with the black keys were like that too mm-hmm. yeah and then they just realized yeah, they could make much. a lot of money from it and then commercials and everything started pulling their songs yep i will say though uh, anytime i hear the, the intro to gold on the ceiling does make me think of oceans eight yeah i get yeah, i mean that I that was uh nhl 19 i think it was in there, so I get that. Mm-hmm. I get that. It's, it's one of the few songs. I turn off a bunch of songs in the soundtrack, and that was like one of three that were on re- repeat. So there's... You're one of those people where you go in and just turn off songs in the soundtrack? Not anymore. Now I just, I I barely, I think I just turn off the soundtrack completely. You know, like I have the new FIFA, and I've just turned the soundtrack off. <laughs> Well, yeah, why would, why would you have the, the sound on? Like, there's no reason. I just completely turned it off. I don't know. It's... I play podcasts. I play movies. I yeah. play music, whatever, in the background. Put my Spotify in the background instead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, is, what, is, what a waste of time. Why not? It, it's fun to, like, hear, like, you know, like, if you do, like, a creative player to, like, hear your name in a game or whatever, like, within the context of, you know, whatever stupid nickname you pick. Um but like beyond that, it's like I can't I can't listen to that for very long. No. I need to. I don't, I barely listen to the games when it's on TV. Yeah. No. It, there's a lot of times I've got that just down. I'm just kind of tuned in into the game. 100. percent I'm on the same boat. But uh, yeah, I mean, we should probably <laughs> should probably get into what we uh, we came to talk about here. We're wrapping up our division previews. Settling on the Atlantic Division with the Buffalo Sabers as our deep dive team. Um, and then obviously we're going to do our, our kind of little mini preview of the Atlantic, what that's going to look like, um, and then dive right into this Sabres team that uh, doesn't look like they'll be much better than last year, but kind of in the same mold as the Ducks. They'll be more fun, right? They've got an injection of young kids in the lineup, and at, at the very least that's going to make them an, an interesting team to watch that could surprise a few people if things go well. Yeah, I mean, I think... The thing with Buffalo is that everyone is just kind of refuses to believe that it's real until it becomes actually real because it's felt like it was 
supposed to be there for so long like that they were like yeah. this but uh, uh, and it's just been so just uh they were so like, close and then just awful for and just so forever. bad and like they kept getting in these players and some of them were great and some of them weren't but it's just like oh my god like this is just bad luck all over the place like this is just every time there's something positive it feels like something else comes out of nowhere being so like, bad you miss out on, on mcdavid and you get eichel and then he walks <laughs> yeah like oh brutal man like it's it's just bad luck all over the place yeah. but it's interesting we were kind of talking about it before we started recording and like the thing that's interesting about buffalo and the atlantic is like i feel like buffalo is kind of the perfect lens to look at the rest of the division through because, you know, where Buffalo is at, they like you said, they're on the ascension, right? They're on their way up. I mean, they have the number one prospect pool, uh, according to Pronman. Like, they have really, really high-end prospects. Like, technically, because of um, age, Pronman still counts Darlene as a prospect. Yeah. So, like, that just gives you some perspective. This guy's been in the league for three or four years already, is still at this point... He's, a prospect. Yeah, he's, he's only 20, like 21, I think, right? Yeah, right around there because yeah. he came into the league at 18. You know, and I think so, like, it. Let me see. I'm sorry. I got the word. I'm already here. Um, <laughs> but, like, I just think it's really interesting because, like, they have all of these pieces in place where you can, like, see how they fit into the big picture of this being a competitive team. And it's just about waiting for them to do it. But at the same time, if you look at this division, it's hard to figure out when they're going to have an opportunity just because of the proven talent on the teams in front of them, plus all the teams that are on the way up with them. You have Detroit, you have Ottawa, you know, both teams are getting better, are going to be better this year, or at least more competitive this year than they were last year. Yeah. And Buffalo should be that way too, and it, no, it those three don't have anywhere to go because the top of the division is almost static. Yeah, it, it's it's a weird spot because I, I mean they're all in different positions. I think Detroit might be the closest team to what Buffalo is at, maybe just a further a further bit along in that rebuild uh, because they've now added some of the you know the Perrons, the Cops in the off season. Uh, where they're like in the middle uh, between what Ottawa is doing and what the Sabres are doing. They started off with what the Sabres are doing and kind of transitioned to to where Ottawa is now. But Ottawa's got this like kind of semi-complete team now where Giroux's a part of that, Dabrinkit's a part of that, their top six is among the best in the division. Um, You know, there's some concerns obviously in that on on defense, but clearly they're on the rise when you've got young players like Norris and Batherson, Kachuk, Tim Stutzla, and a bunch of other guys on the way. Detroit again, Larkin, Raymond, Sider, Kosa, Edvinson, these guys are all on the way, and they're going to continue to get better. Toronto should still be good for at least the next four to five years if they can, you know, with mm-hmm. Ma- Matthews and Marner and, and the core that they have there. Like you said, you can't count out Tampa Bay. They're they're top of the division and is one of the best teams in the division as long as they have their core in place of Stamkos and Kucherov and Point, Hedman, Vasilevsky. They can lose Stamkos. Yeah. As long as they have Vasilevsky, Point, Kucherov, and Hedman, mm-hmm. that team is good. Yeah, and they'll and they'll and, figure and out a way to replace that production with the money that they have. Well, that's exactly up, it. Right? Like, right? So. like when you're looking at it, that is the team that projects to be the next Pittsburgh. Where it's just like, look, as long as those guys are there, they're in the race. Yeah, and they're all um, locked down long term, so it's right. it's going to be and like so. That you're for just a while. like we just everybody just has to like fight for the spots around them, and even if they're not at the top of the division every year, like. Pittsburgh was still a hundred point team last year. Yeah, like that's fucking insane. They're man. one of those teams that like they'll they'll make the playoffs, the head, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if you had asked me at the top of my head, I would have been like, ah, eh, probably like ninety seven, mm-hmm. high nineties. But no, 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 they just find they a were way. still a hundred point team last year. Like, it, it, how you know, how uncanny is it? Every year, get to the playoffs, and no matter where Pittsburgh squeaks in, they can squeak in in the wild card. You say, don't count them out because it's the yeah. Penguins. The Lightning are, are, are getting close to that territory now where no matter where they get in, they have that core and that experience in place and they've won where you're just going to put them in, you know, they, they could be underdogs. They could be the eight seed versus the one seed. And you'd still give them credit to, to go out there and make it a tough series. Right. And 
the other thing when it comes to teams like that, right? Like it's been in like Pittsburgh is again the perfect example. The question is always like, well, what's the goaltending situation going to be like? Yo, that might be the best player on the team. Mm-hmm. Like, he makes nine point five million dollars, and we never talk about it because he's the best goalie in the world. Yeah. It's not even a question. It is in. It, nobody ever talks about the money, and and no, I, and you're, it, it's just insane to me. Like I'm just thinking about it right now, and like you never hear people talk about his cap hit. All you hear them talk about is like, damn, <laughs> Andre Vasilevsky's really fucking good. Yeah, he's and, he's the best goalie. And more. and until Shesterkin came along last year, he was significantly higher than any other goaltender, like a, mm-hmm. a tier above the next guys. It would be Vasilevsky, and then you know. Other guys from there, whoever you know, performed well out there, guys like Freddie Markstrom, they're all in that tier below Vasilevsky. He was just in a tier of his own, and now Shesterkin's kind of vaulted himself into that that tier by winning the Vesna last year in the performance he has. Obviously, he has to follow it up like Vasilevsky has over the last few years. But, yeah, like no one ever talks about it because he's just proven it year in, year out, and how much value he has to the team in the playoffs – you know, what he's been able to do, the fact that the Lightning had never lost back-to-back games in the playoffs, I think, until last year's run was the first time they had done it in, in like, four or five years, and he's a major mm-hmm. part of that. You look at his numbers, I think he's, like, a 970 save percentage in that second game after a loss. Like, it, it was, it was like, 14-0 and record, too. Like, it, he's just so valuable to that team that for the foreseeable future, they're they're going to be one of those teams that sticks around. Like the only teams I could see falling off at some point, I think Boston, I think you mentioned that mm-hmm. is a team that could fall off the, the some of their, their players are, you know, older pieces, guys like Hall and Pasternak, Marshawn, Bergeron, that's going to start to fall apart. Pasternak obviously is going to sign an extension, but I don't think him on his own is enough. Once you see Bergeron, Krejci's back. And when he goes again, um, you know, it'd be basically Pasternak and, and McAvoy and Lindholm that have to carry that team with guys like Swayman and not a lot of prospects on the way. And then Tr- Toronto's another one I can see falling off if they can't figure it out with Tavares, uh, Marner, Matthews, and Nylander. Some guys are going to have to go out the door at that point. They're going to have to restructure, and I could see some down years where things don't go their way because they don't really have the full core in place yet the way that the Lightning just have you know one of the league's best players at each position. Right. I think, you know, I think if you're looking at teams that we, well, I guess we shouldn't speak for the we, we, but like, whatever. Like, I think when you look at like teams that have like a reasonable expectation of having a legitimate competing window for the next four or five years, the two teams that I could see falling back is Florida and Toronto. And the thing with Florida is, is I just think that the margin for error in Florida is a little bit smaller because once those guys all stop playing above their contracts, Mm -hmm. that's when the Bobrovsky things becomes a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing hindering them other than if Spencer Knight can get to the same, you know, anywhere close to the same stratosphere as Vasilevsky or Shesterkin, then you you start to talk about them being in that Tampa realm, right? Of having you know Ekblad mm-hmm. on defense Ekblad, and Barkov and Kachuk and Kachuk. Yep. you know Lindell Absolutely. as well if he can continue his mm-hmm. his ascension. So like of, of of the teams, I think that the best bet to stay top of this division is the two Florida teams. Is Tampa and Florida? I think have the best bet to to be good over a prolonged period of time. But I can definitely see there are some downfalls in Florida with that Bobrovsky contract hindering them for as long as it could uh, and not allowing them to to make that team better, especially when we all know the long term, like this is supposed to be Spencer Knight's team. Right. I mean, plus, you know, you have to look, you know, with Ekblad, like it seems like we shouldn't expect him to play more than 65, 70 games a year at this point. And, yeah. and you know, that's not a knock on him. He's still one of the best defensemen in the league, even for that 65 games. Um, it's just one of those weird things. And then, you know, Kachuk and Barkov, like you expect to be steady and Lundell, you expect to be steady. Sam Bennett, like I love Sam Bennett and I think he's been great for them, but like they took away the play driving, playmaking player 
that got the most out of him because that yeah. line was him, Bennett, and uh, Declare, and they rolled over people. And you know, they don't really have a playmaker now that can turn Sam Bennett into a dangerous player like that, right? Yeah, I mean, Sam Reinhardt's going to play a top line with Barkov and Kachuk, and he's not at that same ability to just drive a line like Huberto was. Right. I mean, you know, and then on top of that, you know, they did trade away Uyghur. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was just a very good player at the top of their lineup. And, like, you know, we talked about the the trade, you know, a lot. And, like, we both liked it for both teams. But I think, for me, I I can see a situation in which it does bite Florida just because some of their other defenders are a little unproven and they got to start getting guys into that, you know, three, four, five range on their D to, to play above their heads. It's a team that needs to go after a guy like Jacob Chikrin just to, to bring in something to that blue line, just in case. What do you, what do you trade though? If you're them, you don't have anything. You don't have a first round pick for three years. Yeah, you, you've moved out best... a lot of stuff that you could have traded already well, in other deals. Yeah, and your best prospect was fucking Owen Tippett, and he's in Philly now. Like, the problem for Florida, and I, I guess we're just doing the division first, it, it, like, the, the problem for Florida for me is that like, I, they don't have a way to get better. They're not in the position, they're like in the opposite position of New York and Dallas, of the Rangers in Dallas, mm-hmm. where. Other than the Bobrovsky deal, they have ways to make room, right? I don't think a lot of those players, especially in that defense, have trade protection. And the problem is they don't have anything to trade to package with win-now players for future stuff. Yeah. You know, whereas Dallas and the Rangers have tons of assets that they can spend, they just don't have any way to make room. Yeah, the the, Flo- the Panthers have kind of already done that to bring in the players that they brought in, mm-hmm. essentially. And they've the the one prospect that that so far has hit in Lindell they need in the lineup. He's not a guy you could move. Like they oh, they yeah. have Denisenko still. They have some other guys, but most of them have been moved out in in deals like the deals to get Kachuk and to bring in Sam Bennett and and to bring in other guys into the lineup. They don't have that left, and they've moved that draft capital to bring in rentals at the deadline, and then all of a sudden they don't have a pick for three years, like you said, and it doesn't give them the luxury to go out and and, and get anybody. They are good enough, I think, to hang around. Of course, um, you know Tampa as well this year, in in, in you know, Toronto is going to be in the mix, um, and then Boston should be kind of that fourth team with maybe Ottawa uh, or Detroit kind of chipping on their heels. But for the Sabers to squeak in there. They have to hope, you know, a Boston and a Toronto fall off and that things click for them faster than it does for Detroit or for Ottawa, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's, that's the ultimate end goal there is they have to beat those teams to contention in this division. Right. Um, Like who would you rather have right now? Would you rather have power and cousins or would you rather have Cider and Raymond? I think I think just based off of um, what we know they can do right now, I'd rather have Raymond and Cider. And a lot of that, it I think, hinges on Cider and the year that he had last year. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, all things considered, Owen Power could go out and match that or do even better this year. And he's expected to win the Calder Trophy. He's that good. He showed that last year um, in college and with Canada that he is that type of player. Um, and for him to to join a blue line that already has Rasmus Dallin is is going to be scary for them. Um, and then Dylan Cousins had a, a good year, but it's you know now year three, and he put up thirty eight points in seventy games. Like he's a guy that where they drafted him, you're expecting him to be a superstar, to be a guy who can you know replace Jack Eichel and be a sixty to seventy point guy at the at the least. So big year for him to break mm-hmm. out and show he could do it. But I think, yeah, if you're, if you're looking at what these guys have already done in the league, you, you kind of have to go with Raymond and Sider because they did it last year. They got it done. Yeah. I mean, he, okay, so where do you think Buffalo ranked in expected goals for percentage in their division last year? 
So one through eight. Six. Yep, exactly six. Mo- what, Montreal. Which of the was shitty worse, teams Ottawa do you think above worse? them? Sorry? So the four shitty teams in the division, right? Montreal, Detroit, Buffalo, Ottawa. Yeah. Buffalo was sixth. Who do you think of the three shitty teams left finished above them? Ottawa? Yep. The Dude, it's like this division is insane. 57.5, 50, 56.4, 56.1, 52.75, 46.7, 45.8, 45.7, 45. That is the drop in expected goals for percentages. Like, it is insane to me, like, that this... I, it's it's wild, dude. Like I just I I don't know how if you're one of these teams, you have a lot of confidence in your ability to be competitive relatively quickly while these players are on contracts that that get the most out of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I think for Detroit and Ottawa, we're gonna start to see this process get accelerated a lot quicker. And we've already mm-hmm. seen that this offseason with the moves that Eiserman made in Detroit, bringing in some older veterans, guys to fill out the rest of the roster, and then obviously the big swings mm-hmm. in Ottawa for Giroux and Dabrinkit to realize that some of these guys are either on the verge of signing contracts, have just signed big contracts, guys like Brady Kachuk, or you've got guys on entry level still like Tim Stutzler that you've got to try and take advantage of this now to be able to bring in players like Dabrinkit and like Giroud to supplement some of these younger guys before they get on big deals. But you know, Ottawa is right on the, the cusp of that because Norris signed a big deal. Um, the Kachuk has signed a big deal. I believe Shabbat's on big money. Dabrinkit will be about to re-sign a contract next year. <laughs> Tim Stutzler, I think, is either next year or the year after. So... They, they need to do it now, and, and um, Detroit's trying to take advantage of the fact that Raymond and Sider are both on entry-level contracts as well, and you've got Edmondson coming yep. up into the lineup, so they're going to want to try and at least compete and get to the playoffs with the roster they have now and these guys on their entry level. I think for Buffalo, the good thing is, in a sense, that they they are a little bit further away. They're, all their young players are starting to break in this year, and it doesn't look like they'll be hit with a big payday right off the bat. You know what I mean? Like a Brady Kachuk out of entry level into, you know, eight plus million dollars type mm-hmm. deal. Um, that could help them where maybe Dylan Cousins' slow start doesn't get him, you know, an $8 million contract right off the bat. It gets him a normal bridge deal. Yeah. Same thing for Jack Quinn, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. You know, Rasmus Dallin at that point would be the only guy who's making big money. Owen Power still has two years after this left before he has to sign a new contract. So all of a sudden, okay, maybe, you know, yeah, you're, you, you have to wait a little bit longer, but you're in the better kind of financial situation because you're bringing up all these kids together right as part of this new rebuild and hey i mean based off how these guys did last year in their progression they look like they're doing pretty good and and i was down on jack quinn when he came out of the ohl i thought a lot of what he did was because of marco rossi and that he was just kind of one of those passengers but he like you had mentioned before the podcast ahl rookie of the year last year and he he was full value for that jj paterka was almost a point per game peyton krebs was a, a big acquisition from the Vegas Golden Knights and and did pretty well when he was playing with Rochester too. So all of a sudden these guys are all they're all in the lineup. They're all in the lineup in their most recent preseason game. They're all expected to play. Add that to that, you know, Power Cousins, Dallin, Tage Thompson, Victor Olafson. You you're starting to build a pretty big core there. Do you what is the worst case scenario for Boston for you this year? Like how bad can Boston be? I'd be missing the playoffs. I, I don't think they'll be worse than, you know, a Montreal or a Buffalo or Detroit. But, you know, Marchand's out for a, a while. McAvoy's out for a while. You know, you could Grizzlies start off for a while. You could start off bad in the beginning of the season and not be able to recover, right? Like, you can't win. You can't make the playoffs right out of out of the gate, but you can certainly miss the playoffs right off the bat by you, yeah. know, you know having a tough start and not being able to recover from it. I can see that happening to Boston. I don't have full confidence in Swayman and Olmark to be 
quality NHL starters and where we're talking about how tough this division already is and some of these young up and coming teams like playing Buffalo is not going to be as easy as it was last year. Playing Detroit is not going to be easy. Playing Ottawa is not going to be easy. Even Montreal to some extent is not going to be an easy matchup. And all of a sudden, you know, where we're looking at teams that you could roll into Buffalo and expect to win three or four nothing. Now it might not be the case. It's still going to be they're one of the weaker teams in the division, but all of a sudden you've got this this young, hungry lineup that's looking to to you know improve on last year. So Boston could get caught by a few of those teams and start off pretty slow. Yeah, I mean, then you you know you have to think of the fact that Bergeron, the end could come for him at any point. Like, there's no reason that he should have had one of the best years of his career yeah. last year. Well, your one two is Bergeron and Krejci, and Krejci was playing overseas last year. Right, and you know you have there's no way to know what that means, right? Yeah, and I can't think of another team that made as significant of a like. When was the last team a? When was the last time a team changed head coaches and it felt like an obvious downgrade? Um, I thank you for well. Okay, my girlfriend just said Randy Carlisle after Bruce Boudreaux. <laughs> yeah, so. true. I was gonna say Barry Trotz, maybe. Um, Lane Lambert. Yeah, and and even but he could be good. He's unproven, right? So that's a little bit different, at least. Yeah, but even Trotz going from Washington and leaving Washington, I know there was circumstances around that, but that was a, a downgrade for what ended up coming from after that. So that's. Yeah, but Laviolette's not a terrible coach. He's not, but it, I, yeah, I, you're I, trying I'd to find Peter Laviolette than John Hines. Yeah, hundred percent. It, it's it's tough, but it, like it is a uh... like I just it's so crazy to me how significantly different I would feel that this was still Bruce Cassidy's team. Yeah, hundred percent. Because you know what he can do. I mean, it puts mm-hmm. it puts it in that that Pittsburgh territory where, like, even if they're down a few guys or whatever, yep. like they're just one of those teams that. And Boston was that and have been that for a while. Those one of those teams you just can pencil in at the beginning of the year, no matter what happens, what their roster looks like. They had the core that you just expected they would be in that that mix, and now all of a sudden there's we're casting doubts about them because the roster is not as strong, and then you know they don't have the top quality coach to kind of paper over some of those wounds right like all of a sudden you're like okay like the holes are there and i don't know how they're gonna patch them up yeah i you know because like you were saying you don't have a ton of, of faith in all mark and swayman and my first thought was like well, i like i like jeremy swayman i think he can be good and then i was like oh fuck he doesn't have bruce cassidy anymore and mm-hmm. the teeth of this defense are going to be missing for a, a fair chunk of time like fuck and yeah it's like, gonna be that, just hampus just Lindholm made, for a while there yeah and brandon carlo yeah which if you're hampus that's got to be nice because i think brandon carlo is as close to josh manson yeah as you're gonna really find um but it is tough i, I mean listen when you look across the league uh that division like i i, I and it's not to say swayman's not good um he, you know, they do. He definitely. I would rather have him over, you know, Nadelka Rich and Huso in Detroit, and you know, Anderson mm-hmm. in Buffalo, um, you know, Allen in Montreal, Craig Allen Anderson, in Ottawa. Forty-one year old Craig Anderson, yeah, is expected to be the starting goalie in Buffalo. Yeah, that's wild. So I think then we can say that we agree that the three teams that should make the playoffs are Florida, Tampa, and Toronto. Yeah. Boston is, is like right in the middle there. Of they should, but they might not. Yeah, it is equally plausible. I'm sure you guys can hear my dog eating in the background. I am so sorry. Um, but it is equally plausible that they get into the playoffs as a 100-point team, that they miss the playoffs as a 90-point team. Yep. Yeah, no, I you think know. so. There, there's, a, there's a lot of things that could go wrong for them where I don't see that being a problem for the other three teams we already mentioned. Montreal should comfortably be the worst team in the division. Yeah, I'd put them. I, I still think Buffalo could, but it, it Montreal, I would pencil in at the bottom for now, but I, I, I do think Buffalo is in that mix. And the only reason I like them a little bit more um, is 
I, I like their younger prospects a bit better, but you still have Suzuki and Caulfield and, you know, Slifkowski hasn't looked great, but give them some time. I want, I want Caulfield to, to, to win the, uh, the rocket this year out of nowhere. That would make me so happy. Only um, the rest of the roster can support them. Instead, you've got Dadanov and Hoffman and Anderson. So, God, Mike Hoffman sucks ass. See, that's the thing. To like Montreal is Montreal is not a good team. Their defense is not great. Their goaltending isn't great. But they they do still have some some decent NHL players in in their lineup. Where I think they're a bit deeper than than what Buffalo see, is. But the the difference could become in the blue line there with with Dallin and Power being a, you know a big difference maker. So for what Montreal is able to throw over the boards. Yeah, they seem to be. They seem to like have a general, a genuine affinity for Jake Allen there. Like they just signed him to a two-year contract mm-hmm. extension. Um, I mean, funny enough, that Martin Saint Louis being the head coach and having a full summer and a full camp and a full year with this team, like you know, that actually I could see that being why this team finished, you know, four or five wins ahead of Buffalo. Yeah. You know, like I don't think either of them are going to win 40 games, but like if you told me it was like a 22, 26 kind of thing, I, I could totally see that, which leaves Ottawa and Detroit as the teams to step up into the realm that is, or into the hole that is potentially left by Boston. Yeah. Which team do you like better to do it this year? Uh, I th- I think I would say Detroit um, by a slim margin, just because I I like the goaltending a bit more with Huso and Adelkovich. You've got two really good options. We now know Talbot's out um, for five to seven weeks in Ottawa, so it's just Anton Forsberg for a bit. Um, there's no question the top six for Ottawa is the better of the the two, just of what they've been able to add and put together. But I think across the entire lineup, uh, I would give a slight edge to Detroit. You know, Perron and Copper are not small additions to that roster. And you, you add in, you know, you still got Larkin and Raymond, Cider on the back end. Edvinson should be coming over. Um, maybe like a two or three win edge to Detroit. But again, man, Ottawa's top six is going to be scary. And I think this is the year for Thomas Shabbat to really step into, you know, top 15 defensemen in the league territory. Mm-hmm. He's got all the, he's got all the tools in front of him to make it happen. Now it's not just him. So he'll be picking up a lot of garbage secondary assists and some, some extra points here or there. And he could be one of those guys who all of a sudden goes into that 50 to 60 point territory. Cause we, we know he has right. the skill and the talent to do it. If he can do that and that top six can produce like they did tonight, in preseason, like they were all over the score sheet, then Ottawa will be scary too, man. They're they're right, kind of tied in the mix there with them with Detroit. Yeah, I you know, I I, I think for me, I lean, I lean Ottawa because I think you're right that Cop and Perron are not small additions, but I, it's hard for me to say I wouldn't rather have. Debrinkin and Debrinkit and Giroux, yeah. who you know, I mean, Debrinkit is just one of the what ten best goal scorers left in the league, yeah. right? Yeah, one of the few you guys know? who can pencil in for forty, right? So yeah, I mean, you figure you've got him, Kyle Connor, Pasternak, Stamkos, Matthews, Line, Drysital, Drysital. You know, I mean, but like he's in that yeah. conversation. He's the back end of the ten, I think, fairly. But still, that's not nothing. Mm-hmm. Giroux's a really good player. Giroux was really fucking good last year in Philadelphia. It, I, it blew my mind when I looked up his numbers. How good he was. His underlying, how good his underlying numbers were in Philadelphia. I really like what that team can do on a nightly basis. And like you said, I think that top six has a chance to be all over the score sheet, but all over the course of a month. They've got guys that they can expect to score two, maybe three goals, you know, over a 10-day 10, 10, uh, period. And having more than one of those guys is, is crucial because 
you, I mean, we talk about it all the time, like depth scoring is one of the most important parts of building a team, even if it's not obviously the kind of elite scoring upside, it is the ability to consistently put pucks in net for your bottom six and, or your middle six even. And, and this looks like they're going to have, you know, one of the stronger, stronger middle sixes in the league. It's just really tough to play against too. Like they're well-built lines. When you, you think of having to match up against Kachuk, Norris, and Batherson, um, that's a tough line to match up against, not only you know physically, but just the skill that they have. And then now mm-hmm. the new look line of being able to throw you know, your your top young player and Tim Stutzel to throw him on a line with Giroux and, and Debrinket all of a sudden. I think that really fits the game that Tim Stutzel has showed, especially last year in his breakout year, being kind of like a physical energy forward who... Um, has you know obviously exceptional playmaking and, and shooting ability. He just kind of complements what you're going to get from Giroux, who's one of the better two way centers in the league, and then Debrinket, who you had mentioned is you know a top ten, top fifteen goal scorer. Like all of a sudden, if I had to put all the team's top six down on paper, Ottawa's in the mix as being one of the best, if not the best, right? Like you put Toronto mm-hmm. up there, and then you probably put Tampa Bay up there. And maybe Florida, but I think it falls off after that that top line. You know, I, I I think they're right in the mix, and there's an argument to be had that they have the best top six um, depth wise across the you know across every position in in the, in that division. Yeah, I mean, so another thing I want to I want to get to you before we do the the Sabers part. I don't know how to ask this without it being a leading question. <laughs> what are the odds in your – or how likely is it in your opinion that Dylan Larkin, with one year left on his deal, gets traded this year? Um, I, I don't think it's impossible because I know his name had come up a little bit at the deadline, I think, or in the draft as a guy that you could – you know they, they might have to move at some point. I do think both the player and the team want him to be there long term, but if things aren't going the way they expected, if they're well out of a playoff spot at the deadline and they feel like they want this, you know, to draw out this rebuild a little bit longer, then I could see it being a possibility. It, it does just contradict the moves of Perron and Cop, though, right? To to move on from a guy like Dylan Larkin, unless you're bringing back another player who can immediately step into the lineup. I think it's a tough sell to the team and to the fans to be like, yeah, you know, we made all these moves to be competitive and now we're getting rid of our, he's he's their captain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that's tough, especially these intangibles that come into play, but he's from the area. He played, you know, NCAA hockey at Michigan those are guys you tend to want to keep around, right? He's, yeah, he's been sure. around there for a while, um, and clearly the organization likes what he brings. So that would be a tough one, but I, I don't think it's impossible. I, I do think there there is a world where that could happen, and that begins with things not panning out the way they expected for the Red Wings and them being well out of a playoff spot. Yeah, I mean, I think... Because, I mean, at this point, the next best center prospect for them is Casper, Mm -hmm. no? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, I mean, if you do that, you, you set your rebuild back two years at least. And, you know, maybe you can do, pull a, like, again, this is just a hypothetical off the top of my head, but like you could pull something like go get Lundell and try to shorten the, the gap in the way similar to what Florida did with the Huberto trade yeah. where it's just like, Oh, we're just trading for a guy who's going to come in and play the same role. And you know, he's not as far along in his career, but that's actually better in this case. Um, but like, I, I think it was Sarah Valley did like 32 predictions for this season. And one of them is that Dylan Larkin gets traded. And that's, it's, it's one of those things that it's such a crazy idea because he feels like such a perfect fit. Like, I really, really like him. I think he, like you said, he has those kind of intangible qualities as far as like his roots in the area, but also like as a leader, as a captain. Um, You know, I think it was the beginning of last year or beginning of last season that he got like suspended for a game because he like stepped in uh, after someone took a run. I think it might have been Raymond or something, but like, you know, he, but like, 
he's a physical player. He's not, yeah. you know, uh, he's not like a power forward by any means, but like he has the, he has the ability and the size to be physical when he needs to. And he's shown a willingness to play that kind of game. Yeah, he's he's, and, he's physical in like a compete level sense, right? Like how John, yeah. Jonathan Taves was never physical, but he competed hard and he didn't shy away from mm-hmm. battles. And he's he's in the similar mold of a player of what Jonathan Jonathan Taves brought to the Blackhawks in his prime. And that's not a guy that you want to to move away from, especially when mm-hmm. you know what we saw last year was. Dylan Larkin getting back to you know the guy we we knew from the first few couple years of his career, um, you know a lot of the downturn in his play came from when the Red Wings were awful. So you see yeah. them on the 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 upturn last year and, and what he could do. I imagine he's in for another good year this year to set himself up for a pretty big contract. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's right. That if anything, that's the cause of. That's the really the only reason you can talk yourself into a into him getting traded yeah. is because he only has one year left on his deal. If he had another year after that, I don't think there's any way anybody is having this conversation. Well, he's looking at what guys like Josh Norris and and those guys got other kind of comparable centers, and he's saying, "Wow, well, if that guy's worth over eight, I'm getting nine, nine and a half, right? Like Barzell getting nine point one. You can't tell me Dylan Larkin's worth less than that." You know, with similar production, and then everything he brings to that Red Wings organization, I think that's what he's going to be asking for. So I could see that if you think, well, I don't know if we want to lock into this guy at that much for that long. Set the rebuild back a little bit, move him out the door, get some pieces in, and and I th- again, I think they only move him out if they're they're well out of a playoff spot, and then maybe at that point you're in a shout for for Connor Bedard anyway, right? So, mm-hmm. or even if not with the top pick, Adam Fantilli at number three or you know some of the other centers that are available in that draft, then all of a sudden the rebuild turns around a little bit quicker if you think you can get one of those guys and then also get some pieces for Larkin. Um, and not, not that it turns around quicker, but the, the fact that it, you do kind of have to extend the rebuild by moving Larkin, you maybe accelerate that by going out and getting one of those guys at the draft, right? Would you trade Larkin for Rossi? Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's tough. I I would right now. Um, you got to still see what you're going to get from Marco Rossi, right? He's looked good. Would you do it for Rossi and Boldy? Yeah, I think at that point, yeah, you have to. Yeah, it's it's too good to pass up. Because like, what what's the goal for Rossi? Right, the goal is he turns into a player like Dylan Larkin. So if you've already got what you you think Marco right. Rossi can turn into at that point, you know, I don't think you make that trade, and unless you're getting something else in return to you know mitigate the risk that things don't pan out for Rossi. Mm-hmm. Would be an Eisenman move to have to bring in a, you know an Austrian duo down the middle of Rossi Casper. His little no kidding, his little connections like that. Do him and uh <laughs> I mean hell and if they took on uh Dumba or even Spurgeon think about how much that kind of would save mm-hmm. uh, Minnesota's bacon because if you're going Larkin, Erickson, Eck, yeah, that's 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 nice. That's nice. Well, and then Larkin also playing with Kaprizov and, and Zuccarello, mm-hmm. right? So it's the one that thing is. the Wild need is the number one center, and Larkin would provide them with that. Is he a legit number one center to you? He's close. I mean, when we're talking elite number one center, I don't think he's there, you know, in the, right. in the Matthews McDavid category. But I would say he's a number one center. He, you know, he he can. Is do he that. in that Mike Richards tier? When Mike Richards was like full, yeah, force his powers, Mike Richards. Yeah, because he's a tier below like the top guys, like the McDavid's, Matthews, Barkovs. Those he's a he's a tier below that, but he's in that next tier after those guys where you can you can classify him as as a number one center. He's he's a one B if you want to call it that because on a mm-hmm. team with a superstar like that he becomes the second line center. So I I but I would still I think on most teams he is their top line center right. Like I think you can pick out ten ten to fifteen teams in this league where he would be the top center on that team. And if, if that's yeah. the case, then for me, he's a first line center. He's on he's a first line center on the majority of the teams. Then I, I that would make him a first line center for me. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, Pretty good teams too. Like I think he could walk into 
Carolina and challenge Sebastian Ajo for Absolutely. the number one center job, right? So I, I Ajo is in that same category for me as well as being I mean, one of those he, guys on the outside. He takes Hintz's spot right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, walks into New York. Um, New Jersey at the moment until you know Jack Hughes throws mm. it out the, out the water. Um, that one I'm I'm not a hundred percent there. I go with you. I think Edmonton, Colorado, Florida, Tampa Bay, uh, Toronto. Who am I missing? Who else has a definitive number one center? Uh, St. Louis. Going down my list, it's Florida, Tampa, Toronto. Uh, you can argue Carolina, New York, the Rangers. Again, you can argue if he's better than Zibanejad or not. Uh, Pittsburgh, Colorado. All right. In St. Louis, who are you arguing that he's he's? I mean, he walked. Does he take the starting job in Calgary right now? Yeah, I mean, you put him in that category of Elias Lindholm, right? Again, I think you put him above Elias Lindholm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there's a majority. There's a lot of teams he walks into as the the top center. So I do think he is a first line player. Yeah, no, that's absolutely a great way to look at it. I didn't. I think it's just because of the way that Detroit went from one of the most relevant teams in the world to yeah being shit like the rest of us so quickly. That you can just kind of forget Dylan Larkin's just sitting over there being dope as hell. Yeah, I mean, 31, this is, 31 goals, sorry. 69 points last year. Um, close to a career season for him. If he had to play the majority of the season, it would have been. If he had to play those last 11 games. But looks like, you know, again, he has to follow it up, though, because he's done that before. He had 31 goals and 70-plus points over a point per game, and then things fell off the rails. So this is... A big year, not only because it's a contract year for him, but he has to prove that he can do it in back-to-back seasons. And they have a better team around him this year. So there's no excuse for him to not produce at that level again. Okay. So let's do this as a way to wrap up looking at the division before we get into Buffalo. What is the number one, like, what is the storyline or the one big question for Florida? Is it goaltending? Is it coaching? Is it just is Paul Maurice any good? Um, uh, it's tough to like. I would say it's goaltending, but uh, they have two quality netminders, right? So the, like, maybe the question is who's who ends up being the starter. But we saw them share the net last year, and and they at times looked great, and at times didn't. But Florida still was the best team in the league in the regular season, and things worked mm-hmm. out for them. So for me, it's probably how do they transition from relying so heavily before on Huberto and Barkov, and now transitioning to this new era where Kachuk's yes, he's a great player, but how do they? How does that change their style? How do they look as a team going forward here? And how do they? How do they repeat as a team that was the best regular season team last year? I, I think that that change at the top with your superstar players that could be tough to overcome. Okay, that makes sense to me. Toronto, it's goaltending. Yeah, it's goaltending 100%. Can Matt Murray actually be a starter? If not, is Samsonov able to to do it, right? They've both been mm-hmm. 1Bs at best in their career. Matt Murray, again, yeah, you know, he's, he's won the Stanley Cups, but was always kind of the, the backup to, to Fleury for a bit there and only really got the job when Fleury went down with injuries. So big uh, big question mark around if they can actually get it done. What is it in Tampa Bay? Like, uh, is this just Tampa switching into that? It's just the pieces around them, I guess, right? Yeah, the, are the pieces around them enough? Yeah. Uh, around the like, core. Oh, okay, so yeah, because they lost Palat. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, okay. That makes sense to me. It's the same same question we had with um, Chicago after so many years of turnover when they were winning cups, right? Mm-hmm. Is like, is that turnover going to catch up to them at some point? Are the pieces that they mm-hmm. have around that core enough to take them back to the Stanley Cup? you know, year after year after year. So, and now again, like you said, losing Palat, uh, not a major loss, but the next best player outside that core, probably on that team to lose him. That's tough. Well, and he'd been there for so long and, yeah. you know, he was part of building it up. Like, again, this is, you can 
you can say this doesn't matter whichever way you want, but like I do think there's something to the fact that like he was on the team when they got swept by Columbus, mm-hmm. which by the way I think is actually the last time they lost back to back games. Yeah, was when they lost four straight, <laughs> which rocks. Um, for Boston, it's how much do we have left? Like, yeah. it, how good is Bergeron? Bergeron like, I mean, and Krejci, like, it's yeah, just him. it's it's are Bergeron and Krejci going to be able to be the number one and two center for the entire season and into the playoffs? Because they don't have anything else after those those guys. They don't. They they have nothing. I, I, their third yeah. line center last year was Eric Halla, and mm-hmm. this year it's I I off the top of my head. I think I, it's uh, what's his name? Charlie Coyle. Uh, n- no. There's another dude. I think his name starts with a G. Is it Michael Granlin? No, he's still in Nashville. Their listed centers in Boston are Zaka Stadnika. No such Lauko, Krejci, Coyle, Bergeron. Coyle is who I was thinking of, Charlie yeah. Coyle. So Charlie Coyle would be the third line center, um, which is, I think, the, 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 that's the best role for him is the third line center. But is, yeah. is Bergeron and Krejci enough? I don't know. Detroit. Is this, I mean, I mean, fundamentally for them now, it's just like when do they turn the corner? Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know if there's like a major big question mark for them. Um, you, know, you could look at goaltending, but I, I think Huso and Nedeljkovic is fine. Um, yes, it's fine. Yeah, like they've added to the blue line. Sherratt is a decent addition to the blue line. You know, with with already has Cider, and they've added Edvinson, who's come over from Sweden. Uh I think it's just the, the the question for them then is like how how well do the new additions gel into the lineup? Do they make them better? Mm-hmm. Does Perron and Cop make them better? On paper, it does, but does it actually work out? That's I guess that would be yeah. the big question mark for them. Okay, that seems fair. Uh, Ottawa, how far can the forwards take them? Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's just all gas. Yeah, because out beyond Shabbat, there's nothing to really boast about on that defense. And then the Artem Zub's stuff. not bad, but yeah, he's but that's the thing. He's not bad, but your number two shouldn't be not bad. It should be yeah, reliable. Sure. Um, and then the goaltending overcoming Talbot's injury because they could get in a hole real quick. Like I like Anton Forsberg, but beyond him, they don't have anybody for the first five to eight weeks of the season. Okay, in Montreal, the question is, how good is Shane Wright this year? <laughs> I, I'm serious. Like, is that kind of not? I mean, because like nobody expects them to be competitive this year. They seem to firmly be in the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. So at this point, it's did we fuck up by not taking Shane Wright? Like, how good is Shane Wright in Seattle? Yeah, yeah how how good is Shane Wright in Seattle compared to how good is Slavkovsky in Montreal this year? And then I think I think like how some of their um their their additions um pan out. Kirby Doc. Does that work out for mm-hmm. them? Absolutely. Um, but they've they've lost so much that it's it's just how bad can it get? It's basically the question like uh, how how far in the hole are they going to be in this division worse than a team like Buffalo? Because it could get pretty bad for them. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, so then that leaves us with the Buffalo Sabers. Yeah, only an hour in. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, dude, this is an especially rambly episode, even for us. It's it's Um, the last one. It's the last one, and then we're finally into Ducks Talk, because we've got the Ducks preview coming up this weekend. So hopefully it's That's right. What, the season start, what is it, Wednesday or Thursday? Is it 12th? Wednesday, right? 12th is the home opener. The Ducks' first game, I think, is like Saturday. Is it? I thought 12th was the opener. Because the the season officially opens... Tomorrow, or mm-hmm. I guess for me now it's today with the the <laughs> sharks, sharks and Preds, and they're on a back to back. The rest of the, the teams in the league are playing preseason games. Sunday there's nothing. Monday there's nothing. Tuesday the season opens with Rangers and Lightning, uh, Golden Knights and Kings, and then yeah, the 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 rest of the teams or another handful of teams open up on the twelfth. Oh, all right. I don't know what I was looking at then that messed me up. It's that final preseason game on Saturday against the Kings. That's that's the uh, the confusing one because it's confusing to see that that there are going to be two league games played while other teams are playing preseason mm-hmm. games. I don't get that at all, but that confused me too. So, 
So here's the thing that's interesting with Buffalo. They didn't really lose anybody major. The big losses, as I have it, is Aaron Dell and Cody Aiken, which ain't shit. Mm-hmm. They brought in Eric Comrie. They brought up. They brought in Ilya Labushkin, who is going to be a really nice depth defensive guy for them, yep. especially because all of their defensive prospects are left-handed. Labushkin can play with any of them. Yeah. Um. So that's just going to be a nice. I think he's on a two or three year contract. Um, yeah. It's a nice little deal for them, for him nice, and for exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. Good spot for him to go to to play a lot of minutes. I think it's probably the best spot he could have landed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two year deal, two point seven five. Great little, yeah, great nice. little bit of work. Um, you know, I, I mean, they took Matthew Savoie ninth overall in this most recent draft. They had three first round picks in this draft. Like, it. Well, let me ask you this: Is the story of this season Owen Power, or is the story of this season Tage Thompson now? Because of that fucking contract extension. Um, I I think it starts as Owen Power, but it can quickly become Tage Thompson if he doesn't do anything close to what he did last year, right? Like, that's mm-hmm. that's the concern. I do think no matter what the storylines will be about the kids in Buffalo and Tage Thompson will be good enough to escape, like, major criticism. Like, I still think at the worst he'll be a 40-point player because he's going to play top power play and top line. I think he's skilled enough to still just pick up some points. And there aren't you know, other than Dylan Cousins, nobody's really pushing him out of that spot. Like Casey Middlestad's mm-hmm. not pushing him out of that spot. So at worst, he's going to be a top six center for the team. So I think he'll be fine. Um, I, I do think he could become the topic of discussion if he starts slow. But ultimately, it's going to be about Owen Power in the race for the Calder with, you know, some of his teammates as well with guys like Jack Quinn who could be in that race. And then obviously, you know, Mason McTavish and Matty Beneers, he'll, he'll be in that race for the majority of the season you would expect. I think the thing that gives you some sense of optimism for Tage Thompson this season is like you said, there's nobody in front of him. Mm-hmm. He is going to have every opportunity to keep being this guy. The other thing that I thought was interesting, because I would not have guessed that this would have been the case. He was the goals above replacement leader at 12.3. He was also the expected goals above replacement leader at 16 and a half. He underperformed his shot quality and suppression, I guess, essentially, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. And that, to me, is encouraging because if he can settle into 25 to 35 territory right and i know that the difference between 30 and 35 feels kind of insane but i think we're going to start seeing more common 40 goal scores um so I, i just think for me like if he can stay in that 25 to 35 range and you know he's huge like he's like six six or some stupid shit um He's going to get opportunities. He's going to get power play time. Like He's going to have everything to kind of do it. And he should spend most of this year with Skinner and Olofsson here. I think he's – I wonder if he's going to end up playing a lot of time with uh, Tuck. Yeah, I could see that. I I don't think that top line is set with Skinner and Olofsson. It might start that way, but it is a very very real possibility that Alex Tuck (laughs) makes his way to that top line. He's the the most likely guy, and you know somebody like Olafson slides down to play with either Millistad or Cousins. I, I could definitely see that being the case. Yeah, and I just I like Alex Tuck a lot. I just think he's yeah. such a strong like he's just a steady player. Mm-hmm. He plays responsibly at both ends. He's physical. Um, you know, I feel like when when. Um, they were making their run in Vegas. Like it just felt like his name was kind of always right around the action. And, you know, especially given that he's only like 26, I think right now, like he's still pretty young. Yeah. There's, it, it's actually, it's actually not the worst spot for them to be in. Yep. Yeah, I mean, he, he does a little bit of everything. I really do like Alex Tuck. I think it was a great move for them to bring him in, in that trade. Um, I mean, they've got two of the pieces now in Tuck and Krebs that are going to be in the lineup for them. And, um, 
at the end of the day, like Alex Tuck could very well be the best winger on this team at the end of the season, and I wouldn't be surprised. Like he only mm-hmm. really has to jump above Olafson and Skinner and hope that, you know, Quinn or Krebs or Paterka doesn't take that that role from him or that title from him. And I think right now, I'd probably say right now he's the best winger on this team above Olafson and Skinner, you know, just because he's listed on the second line. I, I, I don't think that is a, a negative impact on him. I, th- I think based off what he's done last year and what he's done over his career, I think he is the, the best all-around winger on this team. Eddie, is there a chance that this team isn't as far away as it feels like? Yeah. Jeff Skinner put up 33 goals last year. Kyle Oposo put up 21 goals last year. Olofsson has 25-30 goal potential as well. I think he can get there. If Oposo and Skinner, who are... Skinner is notoriously streaky, and Oposo um, is consistent, but I think he has shown that he is a very good complementary player, right? Like, he got this deal in Buffalo off of being on Tavares' line Mm -hmm. in the Islanders. If those two guys can kind of produce at at the level you kind of expect or hope, I mean, if Krebs hits, like, Krebs is what, 2025? Two-way player, right? You know, I mean... Alex Tuck, I think you can say reasonably, you can ask him to be between 20 and 30, probably 25 to 30 closer. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think it all, it, it, a lot of it hinges on adding Jack Quinn. Like, it, it just hinges on the kids, right? Like, a lot of their success hinges on how many of these guys hit this year. You know, how how well does Jack Quinn do? How does, does Middlestat, you know, get a bump playing with guys like Quinn and Tuck? Uh, Krebs and Paterka, how you know? How do they j- just like Quinn? How do they take the jump up from the AHL to the NHL? Can they get it done? Dylan Cousins, does he jump into that category of being a legitimate, you know, top six four, a guy who can put up fifty to sixty points this year? Dallian is exceptional. We know he's going to do well, but you know, what do we actually see from Owen Power? How quickly does he adjust? So it's all about the kids, you know, Power, Quinn, Krebs, Cousins, Paterka. How well do these guys do if they all hit? And it's a rare instance that all guys hit in a season. But if they do, they are a dangerous team. They are a scary team to face if all these guys get going and play well and start to build chemistry with each other from an early year. And and the the good thing for the Sabres is Quinn, Paterka, and Krebs, all play, and even Middlestad, I think, at some point, all played with each other in Rochester last year. So there is some familiarity there. I think power... And uh, Quinn and Krebs have familiarity from playing for Canada at various levels. So these guys do know each other. And Dylan Cousins as well is in that mix. So, you know, there there is the chance that things could start snowballing in a good way quickly for them if these guys start to get going. I think it is fair to say that you cannot expect Tage Thompson to be your first line center of the future. No, no. Right now that the hope is that's Dylan cousins or Matthew Savoy, or if you can land Connor Bedard uh, in the draft this year. So you mentioned who I wanted to ask you about, which is Matthew Savoy. Matthew Savoy is a high skill, small forward. Given the size that they have in the lineup with guys like Cousins, guys like uh, Tage Thompson, even Jeff Skinner, I don't think he's a small guy. Alex Tux, you know. Is there an opportunity for him to come into the league as a winger and really help kind of raise the ceiling on their first line? Yeah, I, I think I think at the NHL level, Savoy's probably a winger. I, I can't see him being a center at the NHL level. Um, and I honestly think like a 1-2 potentially, at least right now, of, of Tage Thompson and Dylan Cousins, if Dylan Cousins can become a first-line center, that's a nice combo to have. I think they're both physical, tough-to-play against centers that you, know, you add a skilled winger like Savoy to one of those lines. I think that's where... 
you know, those guys can create the space for a guy like that to operate, right? And, you know, you add in some shooters like Skinner and Quinn and Tuck and Olafson to, to those lines to complement him. They've got the pieces starting to kind of develop where it could be the perfect scenario for a guy like Savoy to jump in on the wing and immediately contribute. So I, I, I really do like what they're building. I, you know, the other picks they had in this first round pick in Austin and Coolidge, I think are really good picks. And quietly, the Sabres, who were the joke for so long, Kevin Adams, you know, not being able to draft properly, not being able to win trades, all of a sudden, you know, the trades have panned out for them. They've drafted well, and they're starting to set themselves up for a, a pretty good future. If their top six becomes Krebs, Cousins, Savoy, Tuck, Thompson, Quinn, does that have the potential to be competitive for you? Um, yeah, I mean, if they all hit what their their highest ceilings are, I think for sure it does. Um, you know, Quinn has the potential to be a 30 to 40 goal scorer at the NHL level. Um, Dylan Cousins, when he was drafted, people expected he could be, you know, a power forward center that could put up 60 to 70 points, right? Like if all these guys do hit, then it does have the potential to be one of the better top sixes in the division. And that's what the Sabres are hoping for and continue to amass players like this at the top end of the draft. Matthew Savoy, again, another guy that at nine probably fell a little bit further than he should because of his size, but a guy that they hope can come into the lineup and hit his full potential, which if he does, people out there believe he could be an 80, 90 point player. But again, they all have to hit for it to, to get to that point. And it's very rare that all of your top prospects end up hitting their full potential and you get the most out of them. I agree. I wonder, I wonder like how you feel about it. If we say that everybody hits 85% of their potential, how competitive is that top six? I think it's extremely competitive. I think it's well built. It's, uh, it's got a little bit of everything on all those lines. And we talk about, you know, we talk about the, the Sens top six, if all of these guys do kind of hit close to what you expect from them, I think you can put it in that, that same category is just a very well-rounded top six with a lot of quality players in it. It's not, you know, a um, Toronto with Matthews being, you know, one of the top five players in the league. It's not a Tampa with Kucherov and Point and Stamkos, but it's a different type of, of top six that we've seen teams have in the past. I mean, Chicago, Stanley Cup runs, and, and um, you know, L.A. as well, where they just had kind of well-built, well-rounded, well-put-together top sixes that can carry you through. So I think they, they have the bones of that in Buffalo as long as all these guys start to pan out. Yeah, I, I think I just kind of... You know, I, 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 I'm looking at this and I want, I'm wondering, because I think when you're looking at prospects and, and, and trying to keep in mind, like you're saying, the fact that they rarely, if ever, um, all hit, the vast majority of times, even when you get three or four or five guys to hit at the same time, they very rarely all hit their peak, like their absolute 100% potential. Yeah. And so you, you kind of try to keep all of that and you kind of accept like, okay, well, maybe this guy falls out. Maybe that guy falls out. And you, they have enough first round picks and quality depth picks and things like that, like that they've done a good job. And you're trying to look at what the world looks like with this being a legitimately competitive team. And I'm almost, I'm almost wondering if their best shot is the 2007 Ducks, which is just two great defensemen on the ice at all times. Like, if they're able to have Darlene and Power be on separate lines in each play 25 minutes a night, like, I wonder if that's the best bet. Because as much as I think Casey, uh, Casey was that Dylan Cousins can be good and Jack Quinn can be good, I don't know that their ceiling or what you should look at or project as their reasonable ceiling, Right is high enough to think that they can go your typical, we have a first line center. Yeah. 
we have a number one defenseman and we have good depth. Like I, I, I just, I wonder if Owen power is just so clearly the most important player in this rebuild. Yeah, no, he a hundred percent is. Um, I think the two most sh- sure bets and surefire things that the Sabres have are Owen Power and Rasmus Dallin, as guys that you know. I mean, Rasmus Dallin has almost already gotten to that point. Um, you know, I think he has another level that he can hit once this team starts to get better, and he showed that near the end of last year and, and the way his season went last year. And I think Owen Power, of all their prospects, as great of a prospect pool they have, is probably the surest thing that you can expect to get an elite player out of. And then, yeah, all of a sudden, like you're running into that territory of having two just elite defensemen who can kind of do everything, dallying in the mold maybe of like the Scotty mold of being a little bit smaller, quicker uh, defenseman who, you know, hurts you with his speed and playmaking ability. And then you've got power, I guess. If I, It's very hard to compare these kids to to Pronger and Niedemar, but power is yeah, in that, I, that I Pronger role as being a bigger, more physical guy who still has that – you know, offensive ability to him. But yeah, all of a sudden you start building out that team and it does look a little bit similar to the Ducks in 07 as a championship caliber team where the clear two best players on that team were the defensemen and they just built a very well-rounded team around them to complement their way to a Stanley Cup. So here's a fun fact, by the way. Um, Rasmus Dahlin is the small one. He's also 6'3". Yeah, that's the thing. Owen Power is six six. Yeah, that's what makes Rasmus Dahlin quote unquote smaller, quicker defenseman. He's always just been like the the Pedersen type thing too, just kind of a lanky, skinny kid, mm-hmm. uh, like the you know not in a, in a negative way, but the the Swedish type build, right? Where like Hampus Lindholm was a big guy, but he never looked a big guy, right? He was never kind of built as a big I mean, guy. And even still, he's pretty solid. Yeah, looking. For a Swedish player, yeah, but yeah, and, and Owen Power is just kind of at another level, being you know six six, yeah, and, and being able to move and play like he does. So, um, and yeah, and and yeah, I think I think what you said is important. Is like you don't want to compare them directly to them in that stylistic sense. It's more of a the bones of a competitive team. Yeah, um, you know because. The fact of the matter is, is I don't know that either one of those guys really has that level of bite yeah. that Pronger did. Mm-hmm. But I also don't think that that's, you know, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You can bring that that toughness or or kind of nastiness in from depth players or other top end players that you bring in after those guys. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Henry Yokoharju is pretty physical guy. He's a big guy. I think he's like six, four, um, you know, and I just, I do think that that's it. And so I think, you know, the next, the next most important piece after Owen power, you can say is either Jack Quinn or Uka Pekka or Devin Levi. Yeah. Yeah, if we're talking I mean, strictly prospect, I would say of their young players is probably Dylan Cousins because he needs to, they need him to hit because their their center depth isn't that great. But yeah, if we're talking strictly prospects, I do think it is Jack Quinn or one of the two goalies like you mentioned, Devin Levi or Uko Pekalukinen because they don't have anything after that, right? They don't have a starting goaltender now to rely on. They need Levi or Lukinen to become you know, an elite level NHL goaltender so that they're not looking for one down the road. Yeah. And you know, then you have to hope one of Savoy or Quinn hits and being a top line winger. And that's, you know, that's kind of what you're hoping. And I I think the two you have to look at in that case are like we said, uh, Savoy and Jack Quinn. I love Peyton Krebs. I think he's going to be great, but I think he's, much more of a if he be if he moves to center he'll be a second line center but I think he's more of a quality third guy on a top six mm-hmm. line. Yep, I think him and Paterka are both like like. 
I think there's, and again, this is super unfair because you're comparing them, but like stylistically or, or, or role wise, you hope that maybe he's kind of, um, Marion Hosa. Yeah. As far as just being a, a really responsible two way player, who's going to, um, be able to impact the game offensively at, at, at a very high level, but they're never going to be, you know, the best offensive player on the, on the, on the ice. Listen, we all know uh, Pavel Regenda is the next Marion Hosa, so correct. That's the so, only yeah. comparison to Hosa that we accept. Was that you who posted that? Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> that made me happy to see. Oh, uh, it was. I haven't seen that meme. That's haven't seen that meme in a minute. Yeah, I, it popped in my head. I was like, this, this fits. And uh, I mean, credit <laughs> to the guy who's balling out in in all of preseason, but specifically that game. Yeah, man, he's he's earned his way into the uh, him and Max opening. Jones, man. They've they, Derek Grant, fair. He had a good game, but dude, those two dudes are playing so fucking well. I've seen multiple people who hate Derek Grant say that Derek Grant's playing really well right now. Yeah. That's how fucking yeah. baller that those two dudes are doing. Yeah. Oh, it makes me so happy because it's like, you know, it's not that they're their initial impression of like him is wrong that like he's not a great player but it is funny that they're like no these two dudes are playing so well that like Derek Grant's fine yeah like he's a perfectly okay. fine fourth line center that's place. what you want him right like that yeah, yeah. I'm perfectly okay yeah. with him being on a fourth line and when he's playing with guys who are actually good and can drive play then it's okay but when you're I mean the, the issue became when you were playing with guys like Nick Deloria and it just didn't really work out uh, I I'm not doing right it's okay. Now. We'll bring it up when when Pat's on the show because we know allegedly. Um, ever since uh, Zegris got hurt, he's been back on the Ducks need a guy like Delorier train. So I can't wait for that conversation to come back up. <laughs> so here is real quick, just because we were talking about goaltending and and Devin Levi and Luka Pekka Lukanen are, are two guys. One of them has to be the real deal. <laughs> Craig Anderson is 41 years old. He is going to be their starting goaltender this year. He was 17, 12, and 2 last year. His 17 wins led the team. He <laughs> was a negative 7.77 ex- uh, goal saved above expected. And almost a full nine goals under goal saved above average that is fucking insane to me if you are looking for the needle to use to pop the balloon of everything that we've been talking about if where where this this team is headed to me that's it Mm -hmm. and i have said this before i will say it forever I think goal saved above expected is a team stat, not a goalie stat. Those numbers show you that that team was not playing particularly well in front of their goaltenders. The highest, I think, a goal saved above expected number was like 0.9. Everybody else was negative. I wonder how much goodwill... Ryan Granado has built up with the Buffalo fan base right now, or even with the Buffalo front office, because if these guys are there and he can't get this team to play well, he's obviously not going to keep that job. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's, I think you, you got to give credit to, Again, the fact that Craig Anderson somehow won 17 games and had a positive record with that team. But the, all the signs point to the the wheels are going to fall off the bus with that one. And that's going to catch up to them at some point. Um, and how do they overcome that? Because I don't think Craig Anderson's going to get a regular starter's workload at 41. So he's going to have to split starts with Eric Comrie or Ukapaka Lukanen. And I don't know how ready both of those guys are to do that yet. So if if Anderson well, gets Aircom's in the slump, twenty seven, so he doesn't have a lot of time. God, man, he's uh, I I th- still thought he was like a twenty three year old kid in Winnipeg, man. That, <laughs> some of these guys just stay prospects forever, and then all of a sudden they're twenty seven. Yep. But yeah, like uh, 
never a proven starter, ne- neither with Luka Pekka So if things don't go well for Anderson, um, you're thrusting these guys into that, that starter position to try and get something to happen. And then, yeah, like you said, how, how long, you know, Sabres fans know it's going to be a tough year, but there are expectations that it will be better because of the kids. Well, if that's not going and you're still losing games and, and things aren't panning out well, I think, you know, Sabres fans understand that there's a process, but I think eventually things are going to turn. If these players look like they're the real deal, and it is clear that the giant hole at the center of this is goaltending, do you consider moving Devin Levi for Connor Hellebuck if you feel you're ahead of schedule? I think it depends on how well the kids are doing. But even then, that that's... That's tough because I think they really do like what they have in Devin Levi, and I'm just not sure if Connor Hellebuck, age-wise, fits into what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Buffalo's probably a better spot than Winnipeg at this point, if you could, if you can call. Oh, it that. I think yeah. I think Hellebuck would move to Buffalo and be a perfectly happy guy um, because that town is fucking is talking crazy. And he's an American guy, and it's also still Buffalo, and he'll get to enjoy kind of being home in the States, playing for a, a very big market, but also being outside of, like, the major public eye in any seeming way. Yeah, I, I could I could see it working out. It, it's just tough for me to think that the Sabres are, are going to show that they're that far along in their rebuild, that that trade makes sense to anybody at that point. Like, they would have to be almost pushing for the playoffs for that to for them to think that is a, a reasonable possibility because Devin Levi is a year or two away from you know potentially getting starts at an NHL level so to move him for a guy like Connor Hellebuck you have to hope that literally pushes you to the playoffs uh, and that would be some story to see the Sabres in that position yeah no I, I think that's true I think um, yeah I mean like we said kind of repeating ourselves again but like or i'm repeating myself but i i do think if if there's anything that is going to severely undercut this team's ability to take or even look like it's taking meaningful strides it's going to be goaltending and i mean that can unravel a good thing quicker than shit and what it'll do to a terrible team um is beyond me i think buffalo more than anybody is incredibly happy that uh Chicago and Arizona are going to be the two worst fucking teams in the league by probably yeah. 10 points. All right. So I guess the question I'm going to ask you, Eddie, the last question before we get the hell out of here. Do you think Boston makes the playoffs? Because I think we agree that three of the top four are – Tampa, Toronto, and Florida. The question is what happens with Boston and Detroit and Ottawa. Do you think Boston makes the playoffs? I think, yes. I think they have the best shot of the rest of the teams to make the playoffs. That's including um, teams from the Metro. You know, I don't think the Metro has five teams that are going to get in. I think it will probably be a 4-4 split. So... I think they are good enough to make the playoffs and I would I would put my money on them over, you know, a a Buffalo or an Ottawa or Detroit of of making it there. Um I I think they have enough and when they finally get fully healthy, I I think their roster is good enough to get there. I mean, every team at this point that we can compare them to have question marks. They have the best roster built, I think, of any of them. If we're going to compare them, so I would, I would say yes. Do you think one of Ottawa or Detroit takes that fifth playoff spot, or do you think at at best it's a four four split? I think they could, because like we said in our Metro, I think it's Carolina, New York, Pittsburgh, and then it's kind of a jumbled mess after that. Just like we also think it's. Tampa, Toronto, and Florida, and then kind of a jumbled mess there as well. So Mm -hmm. I I could see it. Like, you know, New Jersey or Columbus could have a really good year. Philly could have a bounce back. Washington could overcome. (laughs) Yeah. 
They're, they're, they're so screwed. They're, they're screwed. Washington. I'm so mad at myself. Washington could could bounce back and and you know alleviate some of the concerns I have about their team. We talked Boston already, Detroit or Ottawa could surprise. So. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely certainly a possibility that that Ottawa and Detroit could could fight it out and be a fifth team that makes it in. Um, I think there's only real six teams in that Eastern Conference that you can be confident going into the season to say that they'd make the playoffs. Yep, I think you're right. I uh, I think I will say it's going to be four four because I I do think Jersey is going to make a real push this year to yeah be a real team. Yeah, I think of of all those teams we talked about on the fringe, I think I I would I would say Jersey has the best chance of doing it over an Ottawa or a Detroit or mm-hmm. a Buffalo, um, and it's just compounded mm-hmm. by the fact that Alexander Holtz has looked excellent for them in preseason, and uh, they already have Hughes and Hisher, um, in the lineup that are going to perform. Brat, Palat, uh, Dougie Hamilton. You know they've they've you know added Marino. I think Vanacek has been a good addition for them to push with Blackwood. So they they've really started to kind of turn the corner. And I would I would say they'd be the fourth team in the Metro right now, and probably Boston still for that fourth team in in the the uh, in the Atlantic. Yep, I agree. Um, Check back on this on season's end. We'll see how right we were. Fucking check back on this in the middle of November and find out how we screwed up. Yeah, we'll see Boston will be ten points out of a playoff spot. It well, New Jersey I will think be rock uh, bottom in the Metro. Uh, I'm gonna die. Yeah, and then they're gonna have Connor Bedard, and they're gonna have three centers, all incredible. Um, well, that'll do it for our big league-wide preview. As Eddie said, the next time you guys hear from us will be the uh, Ducks preview. Um, we are certainly still hoping, praying, expecting uh, that Pat and Jay will be on for that and that we will get to argue again like we used to. Yeah, uh, aiming for this, this weekend, and it, it would be live, um, but still working on kind of the logistics of when, where, and who is going to be on that show. But it will happen before... Wednesday before the season opener, obviously, because we have to get it's season preview, so we got to get it up. So it'll happen before then. Um, just stay tuned for the details on kind of what the timing is going to be for that and who's going to be on the show. All right, everybody. Eddie's about to fall asleep if we don't stop right now. So uh, thank you guys for uh, listening. Uh, thank you very much. We will talk to you soon. Take care, guys.